God bless you, everyone. My name is David from the Resurrection Center. Welcome to our Bible session on June 16th, 2021. Um, I welcome you all and I bless you all. Um, last week, uh, the Holy Spirit instructed the prophetess of the house to focus on identity. That's why Pastor Melly spoke last week about identity versus personality. She put logic to the test. Pastor Millie said, if you don't know who you are, how can you possibly believe in the God we are trying to teach you about? She goes on to say, we are suffering from multiple personalities. 97% stay in the same state. Pastor Millie concludes by saying, unless you realize who you are, how can you believe what you are being taught? Losing identity is following a generation of culture that has no identity. Pastor Melly laid it all out by explaining that we live in a society with personality disorder. That is the root of our lost identity. It was explained that your personality is not you. Your past personality is how you act. Everyone is trying to follow a personality and that is how they act. Personality disorder comes from copying what is not real. It is not from God. People who are stuck stay stuck because they choose to follow a personality instead of trying to be who God wants you to be. Your purpose is the truth in your identity. That's the title of tonight's topic. And our agenda is number one, man is made in God's image. That's the good identity. The Sodom and Gomorrah story. That's the bad uh, identity, and we'll talk about that. Number three, we'll talk about the journey on the road of life. That's living with identity. And number four, who you are and what you do. These are the seasonal changes in your life as it relates to your identity. And number five, what is your value? And this is your God-given significance. And number six, we talk about the hurt. We have, and we pass it on through other generations. So that's what we'll be talking about today. You know, very interestingly, the series topic we are on, Who Am I?, is timely. Just recently, we talked about it at the Bravehearted Men's meeting on Friday, May 7th at the Resurrection Center. The meeting was titled The Design of Your Identity on Friday, May 7th. We asked the question, Who Am I?, and we discovered we have an identity that is designed by God. We talked about who you are and where you are going. We learned that man is made in God's image and we are intended to be modeled after God. That is why we are his children. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, the scripture says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Did you notice I said male and female? Well, Sodom and Gomorrah were two cities mentioned in the book of G Genesis. What a segue. <laughs> Take a look at chapter 19 and you'll learn about it. It's a good example of lost identity resulting in people asking, who am I? Or others asking, who are you? Sodom and Gomorrah have been used historically to understand God's disapproval of certain sexual behaviors. A sodomite is a person who commits sodomy. A sodomy is the illicit behavior not designed by God. See, evil is around us today in today's society, from lying and stealing to pornography, drugs, illicit sex, violence, etc. Other sins that are an abomination to God are described in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 19. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him, and they are. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. You see, moreover, the study of homosexual homosexuality, I should say, is in the Bible that some churches and ministers are afraid to talk about. It goes against their marketing. So it goes against the flashy lights. Basically, in Genesis chapter 19, God sends two angels disguised as men to Sodom, where the men of Sodom threaten to rape them. What's that? 
homosexuality. Same-sex rape was a common tactic of aggression and humiliation in the ancient world. See, that's part of history. God then destroys the city in fire and brimstone, with uh, fire and brimstone. So basically, this is the outline. There's uh, a sin that is so grievous. Uh, that's in Genesis chapter 18, verse 20. Then uh, there's a package of four scriptures. You study this together. This is to understand that homosexuality is a sin. There are four scriptures. The first one is Genesis chapter 19, verse 4 through 8. That's number one. Number two, it's Jude chapter 1, verse 7. Number three, it's Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 50. And number four, the last one, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through 9. And those together as a package helps you understand that homosexuality is a sin. And then in Genesis chapter 19, verse 13 through 15, we learn about God's disapproval of sin. And then God's judgment of sin is in Genesis chapter 19, verse 24 through 28. Now you know what the Bible says about LGBTQIA. That's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and asexual. We also learned our position that God placed us as in, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 13. We are to be the leaders of the land God gave us. We are to be bold and aware of who we are. It's part of our identity. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 13, the scripture says, the Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord, your God, that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. And that's in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 13. Now let's shift gears a little bit. Where are my Facebook friends? Where are they? Have you seen confused people on Facebook? Have you seen that? Did you ever see a post that says, now listen to this, this is a post. Your porn name, your pornographic name, your porn name is your favorite color and your last food you ate. <laughs> what? What? Well, I know what a yellow banana is, but it's not a person and it's not my name. Who is blue spaghetti? Who is purple linguine? What's with you people? Why, such, why answer such a thing? You don't need Facebook to tell you who you are. Now let's have another discussion. Why are you here today? Why are you here today? Is it the popcorn? Why are you here? Look at your actions. You had a purpose and you did something. You got in a car, went in a direction and had a destination. What is your des destination? Why are you here? What are you doing here? The answer is it relates to your identity, say identity. So let's talk about identity. My parents told me I could be anyone I want to be. Did your parents say the same thing to you? It turns out that identity theft is a crime. <laughs> What's up with that? You know, it bothers me that someone can steal my identity and use it to make thousands of dollars behind my back. It mostly bothers me because I currently have my identity and I can't even figure out how to do that. Let's talk about our journey, our journey in life and the road we travel. On the road of life, there are traffic lights. Uh, the traffic lights are green, yellow, and red. That means go, caution, and stop. Our caution comes from fear. We stop because we don't believe. Fear and not believing. What is that? It comes from not knowing who we are in Christ. Today, we'll learn who we are in Christ. Our first stop in our journey is to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We might say something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In your name, amen. Now, people sin because it is human nature to do so. We are born into sin, but we can't start moving in the right direction from sin. It's a choice. You can start moving in the right direction from sin. It's a choice. Consider Romans chapter 5, verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. 
And that's in Romans chapter 5, verse 19. Did you notice that there's a choice? Obedience and disobedience. You see, God created and gave to mankind the gift of free will, the gift of choice. He could have easily made us robots. We can choose to know who we are in Christ, or we can choose to be blue spaghetti or purple linguine. God made us for the purpose of relationship and love. Both relationship and love are only possible in a world where we have the power to choose. That's the free will. See, God designed us to know how to make the right choice. We can celebrate this with Psalms, chapter 139, verse 14. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And that, again, is in Psalms, chapter 139, verse 14. Even with free will, we need to show constraint. Through biblical principles, we are still morally responsible for choices and actions. Free will is one thing, and being morally responsible is another. People know about free will. Fewer people know about being morally responsible. And even fewer people than that know that being morally responsible can be learned through biblical principles. We know that because of church attendance. Few people are learning. Now, let's ask the question, who are you and what are you doing? What you do is based on who you are in search. Uh, I should say who you are in each season of your life. I'll say that again. What you do is based on who you are in each season of your life. Who you are determines what you do and your identity. Who are you? What are you doing? It changes each season of your life. Here's an example. As a toddler, I'm David sucking my thumb, having a good time. As a kid, I was a reader and a runner. I love books and love to run. As a boy, I was an ice skater and a baseball player. I was bad at baseball, but I played. As a youth, I was a tech guy, programming computers, fixing tractors, fixing motorcycles. Yeah, I know how, to, how a Tecumseh carburetor works. I fixed a few. I've also replaced a connecting rod during the blizzard of 1978 in Boston so that roadways could be cleared. As an older guy, I'm a husband, an uncle, a mentor, a teacher, a friend, and more. And even my jokes are getting better. Sort of. When I was young, I did foolish things. Later, I lived through the consequences. Now I'm older and I do less foolish things. That's called experience. Experience turns into wisdom. First of Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. See, scripture shows us that we change over time. This changes our identity of who we are. We change how we relate to people too. Do you notice that your circle of influence becomes larger or smaller? You can impact more people, but you might relate to fewer people. Do you notice that your skills and talents don't matter? It's what you do with people that matter. God gave you skills and talents, so he's not impressed. He knows what he gave you. He's impressed what you do with them for his kingdom. For example, character and integrity, that can be impressive. It determines who you are in Christ. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, the scripture reads, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Now, let's talk about value. value. Do you have value? Do you have value? What is your value? Let's talk about that. Do you ever feel you are in a place where no one sees your value? A story I found on the web. Here, there's enough variations of the story. Uh, it shows it's a little stretch, but it teaches a good lesson. And I'm sure in some areas, it probably holds very true, this exact story. So here it goes. A father said to his daughter, you graduated with honors. Here's a car. I acquired many years ago. It is several years old. But before I give it to you, take it to a used car lot downtown and tell them I want to sell it and see how much they offer you. The daughter went to the used car lot and returned to her father and said, 
They offered me $1,000 because it looks very worn out. The father said, take him to the pawn shop, the car that is. The daughter went to the pawn shop, returned to her father and said, the pawn shop offered $100 because it was a very old car. The father asked his daughter to go to a car club and show them the car. The daughter took the car to the club and returned and told her father, some people in the club offered $100,000 for it since it's a 1968 Pontiac Grand Prix with a 450 cubic engine. That's about 7.5 liters with eight lug nuts on the rims and dual exhaust resonators off the uh, carbureted engine. A black vinyl top with plow powder blue paint job accented with a heavy chrome grill in the front. It's an iconic car and sought out after by many. The father said to his daughter, the right place values you the right way. If you are not valued, do not be angry. It means you are in the wrong place. Those who know your value are those who appreciate you. Never stay in a place where no one sees your value. You see, here's, here's the understanding. God knows your value and puts you in the place where your value can be seen. It's because you have a purpose. That purpose has value. God wants it to shine. Don't be at the wrong place. Knowing your value is the first step to asking for what you deserve. God has placed value on your life because you are his child. You are a child of God with a purpose. That purpose has a God-given value that goes beyond what anyone can pay for. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the scripture reads, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, it teaches us our value in the kingdom of God's glory. So here's Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You see, God has a plan for you. Your plans are not, uh, your plans are not God's plans. God created you for his plan, not you, not yours. God's plan is the identity he has for you. As a creation of God, the identity God has for you is part of a much larger plan than yours could ever be. People facing difficult situations today can take comfort in Jeremiah 29, 11, knowing that it is not a promise to immediately rescue us from hardship or suffering, but rather a promise that God has a plan for our lives. And regardless, of our current situation, he can work through it to prosper us and give us hope. Oh, and about the 1968 Pontiac Grand Prix with a 450 cubic engine, my mother uh, had one for 23 years. And yes, it was powder blue with eight lug nuts on the mag. Oh, and the sound, the sound. Um, and it used regular gas, not unleaded. I mean, it really had a throaty sound. Now let's talk about how the past hurt us and we pass the hurt to future generations. So we impact the future identity. Today's youth generation is a result of today's adults. Recently, I was reading my devotional and focused on meditation during a private prayer and worship with my wife. I posted my reading on Facebook. I took a screenshot and posted it. Blue Spaghetti must have seen it. I think Purple Linguini unfriended me. And I still don't know who Yellow Banana is. I was reading in my devotional and it said, parents that are constantly terror stricken can easily pass this fear to their children. The passage goes on to talk about children. When they reach adulthood, their hearts are in the seedbed in which the devil grows fear. Parents have the responsibility to care for your children's emotional well-being. Fathers, don't provoke your children so that they won't be discouraged. That's in Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. You fathers don't provoke your children to wrath. That's in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Put prayer into your life. Remember the letters in prayer, P-R-A-Y-E-R, -E means pray regularly 
as your everyday routine. That means to have a daily communication with God so that you are not alone. You can defeat fear with the God's word in the Bible. This victory is part of the identity God wants you to have. I like that. Victory equals identity. See, God is good. Second of Samuel, chapter 22, verse 33 through 35. It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He causes me to stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You can develop an attitude of victory so you can defy fear and banish frustration. Be persistent. Let the word in the Bible given by God take root in your life to have a radical influence to overcome fear and anxiety. It is done in faith. What is faith? Faith is belief in God's glory. Trust in God, his word. Trust in God helping you triumph over fear. Have faith. Believe in God's salvation. Trust in his promises. Be obedient to his principles. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2 through 3 says, Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. In other words, you abandon any image of yourself that is not from God. You start believing what God says about you. See, Jeremiah 29, 11 shows that God has a given purpose for you. Remember that? The Bible says that when your identity is rooted in Christ, the fruits you produce in your life will be the evidence of your identity. So one of the best ways to be able to tell if someone truly has their identity rooted in Christ is by looking for the fruits of the Spirit mentioned in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23. An easy way to listen to how they talk. That's just listen to how they talk and you'll see how their heart is. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And that's in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23. Listen to how you talk. Listen to yourself. Do you show fruits of the Spirit? Or do you complain? Do you fight? Do you argue? Do you show pride? Knowing your God-given identity gives you a confirmation of who God is and increase your faith. You know that you're already equipped to do what God is calling you to do as seen in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. And you have faith that God will do his work through you as a vessel. No longer do you need to worry about what other people uh, think or even what you think about yourself. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, the scripture reads, So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. And that is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. God looks at you and sees someone he loves, someone he desires to be close with, someone in need of a savior, someone he desires to be close with. He looks for you in need of a savior. Your true identity is formed through self-awareness and biblical principles. It's by letting go of selfishness and pride. Then your choices become aligned with what God called you to be. It's your true identity. Your God-given identity is one that discards selfishness and personal desires. God desires his people to be saved. And God desires to have us to be with him in eternity only with him. And as you all know, nothing is powerful enough to stop what God has planned. In conclusion, we started our talk tonight about the road of life. We said that there were traffic lights on that road. Traffic lights are in green, yellow, and red. That means go, caution, and stop. The only road where you can blow through a red light is on the highway to heaven. You know who you are, and you know uh, you can be all that God wants you to be. Nothing will slow you down. Nothing will stop you. So what we have we learned today? What, what, what have we learned today? What did we do today? Number one, 
we learned that man is made in God's image. That's the good identity. Number two, we talked about the Sodom and Gomorrah story. That's the bad identity. Number three, we talked about the journey on the road of life. That's living with identity. Number four, we talked about who you are and what you do. Those are the seasonal changes as we age over time. That's the experience and wisdom that uh, develops. Number five, uh, we also talked about what is your value? This is your God-given significance. And finally, number six, the hurt we have and we pass on to generations. Now, at this moment, we will open to prayer and I will pray with you. And so let's pray. Dear Lord, we ask that we fully let go of our anxiety and fear. We choose to believe in you. Today, Lord, we remind ourselves of our dependency on you, for we know in our hearts that our circumstances and futures are touched by your hands. Help us, Lord, when we are struggling to see clearly and make decisions. Bless us with inner peace. Thank you for giving us the strength to help each other. We look to you, Lord, for the power and possibility that is our future. We ask for your guidance so that we might walk fully in your path a path that you have blessed. We also ask for your face to shine on us. Please bring to fulfillment all that you have given to us to do in the weeks ahead. Give us the heart of wisdom to hear your voice, Lord, and then to make our footsteps firm. Please make us strong enough through your favor and grace. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining me. My name is Dave.